So we've got a few. Okay, you guys can follow along. Just repeat the course when it comes up. Everyone else, uh, this is Light Fields 101. So we're going to kind of cover light fields in general. Uh, just out of curiosity, who thinks light fields have something to do with refocusing? Good. All right, we're a little more educated than that. What about who thinks it's just a bunch of marketing shtick? That's not entirely wrong either. But all right, so here's what we're going to cover today. Uh, Light fields of a couple of different scales, what I call macroscopic light fields or holographic light fields. Uh, we'll delve into the history just a little bit, talk about capturing light fields. Then we're talking about micro light fields, um, which is probably what most people are familiar with. So um, holographic light fields are not this, OK? It's not about the original light show camera and refocusing. It's much larger scale than that. But to understand it properly, we should talk very quickly about what we mean by light. Light moves in straight lines. Um, we model it as either rays or photons. But you can think of it as moving in completely straight lines, and it's everywhere, all around us. If you want to describe the light in a large space, you actually have to use five dimensions to talk about it, right? If you think about an individual light ray, you go to a single spot in space that's three dimensions, x, y, z. Then you have to specify the direction of the ray of light. That's two more dimensions, like latitude and longitude. So it's a five-dimensional function we talk about describing all the light in an area. Um, three dimensions spatial, two dimensions of angular. However, that's a little bit overdetermined. It turns out that this light ray is the same as this light ray here. Um, so you can actually collapse the five-dimensional function down into a four-dimensional surface. It's a little abstract, so let's talk about it in more concrete terms. Consider a goat. Uh, and consider a goat that has light bouncing off of it, right? And then consider some people staring at a goat. Um, the way they perceive the goat is the light bouncing off of the goat enters their eye and forms an image in the back of their retina. Um, and it's really critical, by the way, the world, though the world is 3D, though we perceive it in 3D, in fact, we are sampling a four-dimensional light field with our eyes, creating two-dimensional images, OK? Now, if you do that, if you have this image of a goat, and you actually capture all that light and you can play it back again, that's effectively uh, a hologram. You actually can see every possible view of the goat through that light field. Uh, consequently, you don't actually need the goat. You've got a hologram of the goat. You've got the perfect image of the goat. So. Large-scale macroscopic light fields are a way of capturing holograms. We have capturing images and synthesizing perspectives. Uh, if I was carrying a mic, this would be the mic drop moment. Uh, macroscopic light fields are holograms. So that's really critical because uh, this very particular uh, view of mine, but I think it's pretty valid, is that all of these new display devices are inherently holographic, right? The difference between a VR headset or an AR headset and traditional screens is that you need to be able to deliver new views to the users they walk around. That's functionally a hologram. If you don't, your images are just going to look like a poster. They can walk around and they won't parallax correctly, they won't have reflections. So we need these holograms. Also, our screens are becoming holographic. Um, they're not in the market yet, but we've seen some demos. Uh, Multi-perspective screens are right around the corner. So in the future, we're going to need light field technology, capture, delivery, and decode. Uh, in order to deliver content to all of these new displays properly. In a sense, like we're a little bit late, frankly. The headsets are already here. Uh, light fields are helpful for VR and AR. So if we're synthesizing views, you could wrap light fields all around a user, and that's basically immersive VR. It's immersive VR that's stereo and has positional tracking, though. Uh, the sort of inverted version of that, if you wrap light fields inward around an object, you can use that to recreate a hologram of an object uh, for an AR headset. Um, like playing a basketball game on your coffee table, okay? So that's how light fields actually sort of serve both markets properly. Oh, sorry, if someone's taking pictures of that, go ahead. <laughs> um, all right, so to understand how to capture light fields properly, let's think about what a real camera does. Uh, and this is kind of critical. Our eyes are sampling a light field, so do cameras, but they sample it in a single spot, a single pinhole, right? And it's functionally, here's the light field again, there's no tree, it's just light. Um, it's actually only sampling it at a single perspective, right? You think about a perspective is defined by your position in 3D space, and therefore a camera only has a single perspective, which is why it produces a two-dimensional image, right? Two dimensions of angular, and that's it. That's really not quite enough for producing light fields. OK, so the punchline is cameras produce single perspective images, but we really need holograms or light fields for these new displays. And that's really hopefully why everyone's here, because we all realize that, and that's really important. OK, light fields. Light fields are not actually that new of an idea. Um, to understand, we've got to think back to the history of how people think about seeing and vision and light. Um, we go all the way back to the Greeks. They, some philosophers believe that we saw or we see by having light rays shooting out of our eyes. This is not correct. Uh, it was kind of fun. Um, then da Vinci and the sort of Renaissance artists started to understand the geometry of sight. That's sort of, OK, light moves in straight lines and implies certain things about perspective. Starting to get closer. But the first person to really discuss light fields was an English physicist named Michael Faraday. 
And he was actually filling in for a talk, probably not unlike this one, to a bunch of future AR enthusiasts, uh, about uh, light fields in general. He just sort of riffed on the idea of light moving everywhere and being this sort of like collective vibrations in the ether all around us. Now we happen to know that there isn't any ether, and the light is just moving through empty space, but I love the idea of this light field jello all around us. Um, the first practical attempt to capture light fields was a little bit later though, 1908, uh, another physicist by the name of Gabriel Lippmann, future Nobel Prize winner for his work in color photography, uh, proposed to a French group of scientists an idea for making a light field holographic capture device. Uh, there's a little cross section down there at the bottom of his illustration, and he asserted that if you sort of made this waffle press and, and squished out glass in the right way, you could make a light field camera. Um, you know, again, he's a physicist, he didn't actually build it, he just said here, Let's go, someone go find an engineer and build this for me. Uh, and it's sort of interesting, it would have been a playback device also, obviously this is way before the days of digital, and so they would have coated the back of the glass with film emulsion, uh, and what would happen is the light strikes the front of the, the lens, it would be uh, collected on the back, uh, and then you would shine light backwards through it, and it would recreate the light field. It's a lovely idea, but it would not have worked. As it turns out, it would have reversed the ray directions, does all sorts of weird stuff like depth inversion, but it was a good, it was a good idea anyway. Um, the more powerful idea here though, um, because that was sort of like a modern micro lens array, right? Um, the powerful idea is actually one that, um, that still applies, this idea of taking this four-dimensional light field and embedding it in a two-dimensional image. So you can see this sort of grid of images as being a two dimensions dictating where, which position you're in, that's like which micro lens is actually creating the image, and then within that, the individual image actually has two dimensions that dictate the ray direction that came in. And that's exactly how micro lenses work, and that's the way they sort of fold this four-dimensional light field onto a two-dimensional raster. Um, even in this non-functioning camera, that principle would have at least been true. Um, so the Lippmann array was, the Lippmann array is sort of what I think of as the first array camera, which is certainly a popular idea. <coughs> Pardon me. Light fields then got kind of dormant for a while. Uh, it was impractical in 1908. It stayed impractical for quite a while uh, until the sort of revival of, of this idea in the ages of computer graphics. Um, in fact, computer graphics people first coined the term planoptic function. Um, I'm just gonna briefly touch on it here. There's some foundational people that you should be aware of. Mark Lavoie has some amazing papers, uh, has started a, a lab at Stanford that's done a lot of good work. I mentioned Paul DeBevec in particular because he has an awesome 50 minute talk on light fields that you should go look up. He delivered to the Institute of Creative Technologies. Strongly recommend you go check that one out. Um, and then I also mentioned Ren Ong in 2005 because of his project, which is Lytro. Okay, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, this is a Stanford array, again, sort of a little bigger than the Lippmann array, but similar idea, a series of cameras taking two-dimensional images. Here's another one, a little denser, two-dimensional array, two-dimensional images, that's how we're creating our four-dimensional light field. Um, and so that was sort of the state of the art for the last five, ten years. Now that we actually have display devices for these four-dimensional uh, light fields, the idea of an array camera is starting to be a little more appealing. Now we see these sort of what I call big balls of cameras, right? People sticking all these cameras in a circle to try to generate VR footage. They're not dense enough to create a proper light field. You can see from this uh, Stanford camera array down the lower left, you gotta really pack those cameras tightly together to generate a legitimate light field image, right? And the trouble is certain subject matter requires even denser cameras. The little reflection on the bottom of the boat there, if you stuck the array right there, every, anywhere you didn't actually have a camera, we would miss the little glimmers and glints off the water. So this is a pretty hard problem. Um, people are working on it, uh, but right now it's, it's still in its nascent state. Um, okay, another way of doing live VR or AR where you can move around and see stuff is to try to model the world in a volumetric way. And the idea here is you've got polygons and you paint the polygons with textures. Sometimes real world, sometimes totally synthetic. This is a valid way to, this is the only way to do video games, it's a valid way to think about the world. But there's some problems with approaching it this way that light fields address. And uh, since a picture tells a thousand words, here's four thousand words why volumetric doesn't really work particularly well. Uh, the volumetric assumption is that the world can be modeled as polygons. Smoke, mist, clearly not fall under that assumption. Uh, it assumes that every uh, surface uh, has a well-defined color, but of course anything that's got any reflection to it, uh, the color or intensity of light bouncing off of it changes as you move around. Uh, if you move around, a certain spot on that car hood is gonna change based on the light that's bouncing off of it. It's gonna look different. If you glue that reflection down, things are gonna look a little bit fake and a little bit plastic. And there's the biggest problem. We're really tuned to understand the human face, and if the human face has all these baked-in reflections, or worse, no reflections, everything looks very false, kind of uncanny. So my assertion is that volumetric is uh, interesting, but is, will, will eventually fail and be a dead end, and we're gonna need light fields to really properly produce the content people wanna see. That's for VR and AR. Okay. So that's large scale holographic light fields. There's other class of light fields, and this is what most people assume we talk about when we talk about light fields, which is the micro scale light fields. 
Uh, here's Ren Ong's project, the Lytro camera, the original one, and it did refocusing. It was actually using a holographic light field as well, just a very, very small scale one, inside of a camera. There's that Lippmann-like array inside of a camera pressed up against the sensor. It was doing the same idea, though, four-dimensional embedding of a two, uh, sorry, two-dimensional embedding of a four-dimensional image, only instead of uh, being outside of a camera on a large scale, it was very small, and it was recording a hologram inside of a camera. And you can see here, this is an actual image taken from a Lytro camera, and it's a series of little tiny lenses, and each one is an image of the back of the lens. Now, a hologram inside of a camera behaves very differently than a hologram outside of a camera. You can, if you're mathematically inclined, you can think of a lens as a tensor transform on a light field. But what that means is you can still do view synthesis. You can still move the light rays around because you've kept them separate and sort of figure out what views you would have seen if you had put the sensor in a different place. That's how you get your refocusing. Turns out with those old school view cameras, when you move the sensor back and forth, that's how you focus. You do the same thing inside of a Lytro camera, just digitally after the fact. There's other stuff you can do too, which is sort of interesting. Um, you can do tilt focus and split diopter effects and all sorts of fun stuff. But functionally, you're doing novel view synthesis from a raw light field that you captured inside of a camera. Okay, so that's kind of neat, that's kind of interesting. Doesn't really apply so well to VR and AR though. Um, and of course, at this point, it's probably worth mentioning the elephant in the room when we talk about light fields, really the, the tiny elephant in the room. Uh, Magically's been talking about their light field display, and I should say right now, uh, I have absolutely no idea what they're doing, but I'm totally willing to speculate. Um, and of course, that's something that everyone enjoys, enjoys doing. Here's my theory, okay? If they're really doing a light field-like display and it's not some marketing uh, schlock, uh, what they're talking about is a micro-scale light field, but not one inside of a camera. They're talking about one across the pupil or across the eye, right? And the idea is instead of just a single perspective being delivered internally, there's some, some sort of spatial variation across the eye's pupil. That, that, that's a possibility, not necessarily what they're doing. Here's why that would be interesting. Um, first, imagine looking at an object that's far away at infinity. If you look at a particular point on that object, it represents a bundle of rays that are coming towards your eye. If the object is far away, those light rays come in roughly parallel. On the other hand, if you have an object that's very close, a single point on that object produces rays that come in at a changing angle across your pupil. That is how you understand focus, okay? The reason something looks out of focus when it's close until your eyes accommodate is because of the differing angle across your pupil. Now, if Magically can in fact deliver varying, basically can deliver a light field right up to the eye, they can achieve the sort of focus effects. And it would look something like this. If you recreate a light field there with spatial variation across it, we can convey focus uh, in our subject matter that we're delivering to the user. And that's interesting. It solves the focus accommodation problem. I have to be honest, I don't really care that much. I mean, I, uh, I wear glasses, so like, there's not really a focus accommodation problem for me. It changes all the time whether or not I'm wearing my glasses and I don't get headaches. I don't know how big a deal it is for eye strain and other people, though. That's just my two cents. So anyway, we don't actually know that this is what Magic Leap is doing. Uh, it's just something that they might be doing. Okay, so uh, macro light fields we talked about before, holographic view synthesis that gives us VR and AR content that'll be photo re photorealistic and allow for positional tracking. Um, the micro light fields, that's more for refocusing in cameras and Lytro type stuff uh, and, and may also apply to light field type displays inside of headsets. That's kind of like, it's a continuum, right? There's large scale light fields, small scale light fields. The theories are all the same though. Okay, so this is all lovely. Light fields are awesome, they're great, they're the future, but there's three, three and a half problems, frankly. Um, they produce a lot of data, right? If you imagine that, that array of two-dimensional images, right? Each one's gotta have a lot of data to carry it around. And then finally, this sort of massive problem around optics. If you wanna use a light field, you gotta keep each, each light ray or each small bundle separate, which is a really, really powerful optical problem. Um, and people are working on that, but these are the central problems you have to deal with if you're dealing with light fields. The good news is, on the data side, though light fields represent a very large amount of uncompressed data, they are extremely compressible, much more so than two-dimensional images. Uh, and that's an important insight, and it will actually allow us to have light field technology in the very near future, on the scale of a year or two, not 10. Um, on the other hand, optics, still a big problem, uh, but you can interpolate. So if you're doing macro holographic capture, provided you get your capture density high enough, you can interpolate the rays you miss. That's the good news, right? Uh, in fact, Lytro's doing that with their VR capture system, hundreds of cameras in one spot, which allows them to interpolate between them. So they don't have to capture every light ray, they just capture most of them. Uh, on the micro side, it's a similar problem, you gotta keep the light rays separate, but you can't really count on the user to interpolate missing light rays, I don't think. So sort of the optics problems continue to, to, to multiply a bit. So suppose that's what this is all about, I mean, in theory, we don't actually know. Um, and that's, uh, that's the idea. So, uh, my name's Ryan Dom. I founded Visby uh, this year. We're working on fundamental light field technology, and hopefully we'll have something really concrete to show you in about a year or so. How are we doing on time? Yep, we're done. Done, done, out of here. All right.